Madam President, um, <clears throat> last week, Leader McConnell called up a bill uh, to the floor of the United States Senate. It was a coronavirus relief bill, which included uh, a number of components that uh, both sides had agreed needed to be in any coronavirus relief bill. It was a, uh, a targeted bill. It was a fiscally responsible bill. And it was a bill that was rooted in reality. In other words, there was a, a belief uh, that it could be signed into law if, in fact, it was passed by the Congress. Um, and so um, when it was called up, obviously, uh, we talked about the features in the bill, many of which are things, as I said, enjoyed bipartisan support. Um, it had a, you know, I said it was fiscally responsible, it actually repurposed funds uh, from the previous coronavirus relief bill from the CARES Act that had not yet been spent. So it took re some of those dollars, repurposed them, used them in other ways, which I think would be a, a fiscally responsible way in which to approach the whole issue of how we spend taxpayer dollars on any issue, uh, including a crisis. And, um, and so there was a, a, a repurposing that I think, again, represents a fiscally responsible approach to doing this. It, um, it also uh, addressed the issue of people who are unemployed. It had a provision in there that allowed people to continue to receive unemployment insurance above and beyond what their states offer in terms of a benefit, uh, $300 above that uh, on a per week basis, which uh, for uh, on average represents about 85% re wage replacement. So about 85% wage replacement um, in terms of an unemployment benefit. It also included bipartisan improvements, bipartisan amendments and modifications to the PPP program, things which uh, both sides had agreed upon, a program that's been very successful, but which needed to be expanded and, and, uh, and reauthorized. And so it included uh, those changes, again, uh, bipartisan changes. It included significant funding for both uh, elementary and secondary education about $70 billion there to help our schools open safely, and another 30 to $35 billion for colleges and universities for the same purpose, to help them be able to open safely. Again, a bipartisan, a bipartisan priority. Um, those are just a few of the things that were included, uh, Madam President. It also included, of course, additional funding for vaccines, therapies, testing, all things that we think are vitally important if we're going to defeat the virus. So those were all components that were included in the bill last week that was brought up to the floor by the uh, Majority Leader, Senator McConnell, uh, and it was blocked. It was filibustered by the Democrats. Now, when I say blocked, um, I'm not talking about blocking the end bill. I'm talking about blocking even getting on the bill. It was a motion to proceed uh, under the Senate rules, something that's necessary to get on a bill. And it's important, I think, to point out that there are several ways in which a bill can be stopped, and they require a supermajority, 60 votes in the Senate. Um, once you are on a bill and it's subject to an amendment process, uh, you can, at the end of that, if you don't like the bill, you can still block it with 41 votes. In other words, it takes 60 votes to get on a bill, to proceed to a bill, and 60 votes to get off the bill, to report it out. And so there are several... Um, places where if you are opposed to something and you think that you haven't been feeded, uh, treated fairly, you can, uh, you can block it. But blocking the motion to proceed means you're blocking a bill, even just the, the idea of getting on the bill and opening it up to an amendment process and debating it on the floor of the Senate. That's not obviously the first time that's happened. That happened on the police reform bill. Uh, it happened earlier this year on the original CARES package. But on the police reform bill, you had, again, a bill that had many bipartisan uh, provisions in it. In fact, about 75 to 80 percent of the bill were things that both sides agreed upon. And there again, the motion to proceed just to get on the bill was blocked. It was a use of a filibuster. It was use of the 60-vote threshold in the Senate to prevent uh, the Senate from even proceeding to the bill, uh, even after, I would add, the um, manager of that bill and the author of that bill, Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina, had indicated and through the leadership that they would be willing to accept up to 10 amendments, up to 20 amendments. They were offered uh, unanimous consent to get 10 or 20 amendments offered to the police and reform bill, but it was still blocked even on the motion to proceed uh, by the Democrats in the Senate. So when they blocked the bill last week, um, it was pointed out, I think, 
accurately by the media, the reporting on the bill, these were a few of the headlines that give you a sense of the reaction. The Hill, and I quote, Senate Democrats, Democrats block GOP relief bill. Uh, the Washington Post said Democrats block slim down GOP coronavirus relief bill. ABC News said Democrats block Senate GOP COVID-19 relief proposal. National Public Radio said Senate Democrats block GOP's $300 billion pandemic relief bill. So those were some of the headlines. And, um, you know, and maybe this doesn't mean anything to anybody but Congress watchers, but you can't, <laughs> I'm sure the irony is not lost on anybody who follows this process. The Democrats used the legislative filibuster. When I say blocking a motion to proceed, it is the use of a legislative filibuster to block a bill um, last week, and as I mentioned several times earlier this year, at the same time that they are calling for an end to the legislative filibuster. Imagine that, Madam President. Think about the irony of that. On Friday, NBC News reported, and I quote, Democrat insiders are assembling a coalition behind the scenes to wage an all-out war on the Senate filibuster in bullish anticipation of sweeping the 2020 election, end quote. So the very mechanism that they used repeatedly here just in the last year, but frankly for the last six years that they've been in the minority to block or in some cases even to improve a bill that comes to the floor of the United States Senate, they are now talking about getting rid of that very rule. I mean, think about that. The, the irony of that is pretty rich. It was a disturbing confirmation, Madam President, that the campaign by some Democrats to, limit, to eliminate, I should say, the Senate's nearly 200-year-old practice for considering legislation has become official. It used to be sort of whispered around here, talked about, but now they're talking openly about getting rid of the filibuster, and it puts into stark contrast the choice that voters are going to face in November. So what is the legislative filibuster? Well, it's the product of the Senate's tradition of unlimited debate. The legislative filibuster is essentially the requirement that 60 senators agree before the Senate can end debate and vote on a contentious bill. In other words, you need 60% of the Senate to agree before you can pass a bill. Now, what this means in practice is that unlike the House of Representatives, where legislation can easily pass with the support of just one party, in the Senate you generally need the support of at least some members of the other party before you can pass legislation. Nowadays, the Senate's filibuster rule could be said to be the primary thing that distinguishes the Senate from the House of Representatives. And that matters because the Senate is supposed to be different from the House of Representatives. The framers of the Constitution desired the Senate to be, as the minority leader once said, alluding to the legendary exchange between Washington and Jefferson, the cooling saucer of democracy. Wary of, to quote Federalist 62, the propensity of all single and numerous assemblies to yield to the impulse of sudden and violent passions, end quote, the founders created the Senate as a check on the House of Representatives. They made the Senate smaller, the senators' terms of office, office longer, with the intention of creating a more stable, more thoughtful, and more deliberative legislative body to check ill-considered or intemperate legislation. And as time has gone on, the legislative filibuster is the Senate rule that has had perhaps the greatest impact in preserving the Founders' vision of the Senate. Thanks to the filibuster, it's often harder to get legislation through the Senate than through the House. It requires more thought more debate, and greater consensus. And Madam President, those are good things. Historically, senators of both parties have recognized this. They've seen beyond the narrow partisan advantage of, of the moment and fought for the preservation of the filibuster. In 2005, when there was talk of abolishing the judicial filibuster, Democrat senators, some of whom still serve in this body today, fought fiercely to safeguard it. At a rally in March of that year, the current Democrat leader said, and I quote, they believe if you get 51% of the vote, there should be one party rule. We will stand in their way.
Because an America of checks and balances is the America that we love. It's the America the Founding Fathers created. It's been the America that's kept us successful for 200 years, and we're not going to let them change it. We will fight, and we will preserve the Constitution." End quote. That's from the current Democrat leader back in 2005, speaking about proposals to eliminate the filibuster. Well, unfortunately, Madam President, Democrats changed their tune a few, few years later when they thought abolishing the judicial filibuster would serve their advantage. But even then, Democrats and later Republicans sought to distinguish between confirming nominees and the importance of preserving debate on legislation. And now they're talking about abolishing the fundamental practice of the Senate, the legislative filibuster, for the same prospect of temporary partisan gain. Nothing's off the table, the minority leader said when asked about Democrats' intentions for the legislative filibuster if they win back the Senate. Far cry from what he said just a few years ago. Madam President, eliminating the legislative, legislative filibuster would permanently change the nature of the Senate. The cooling saucer that the founders envisioned would essentially be gone. And the one-party rule the Democrat leader decried back in 2005 would become a reality. Some might ask why one-party rule is a problem. After all, sometimes one party wins the Senate, the House, and the presidency. Shouldn't that party be able to pass whatever legislation it wants? Well, the answer is no, Madam President. Our country is relatively evenly split down the middle, with the advantage sometimes moving to the Republicans and sometimes to the Democrats. But even if one party were a permanent minority in this country, one-party rule still wouldn't be acceptable. Let me go back to the Federalist Papers for just a minute. Federalists 10 and 51 discuss two issues that the founders were concerned about, minority rights and the tyranny of the majority. While we tend to think of tyrants as single individuals, the founders recognized that a majority could be tyrannical as well. And so the founders created a system of government designed to prevent a tyrannical majority from running roughshod over the rights of the minority. And one of those checks was the Senate. And today, the legislative filibuster may be the single most important thing preserving the Senate's constitutional role as a check on majority tyranny. By requiring 60 votes, the filibuster ensures that any legislation has to take into account the views of a broad group of senators. With a 60-vote threshold, you're unlikely to get your legislation passed unless you bring some senators of the opposite party on board. And that means the minority party has a real role in shaping legislation in the Senate, something the minority party in the House lacks. Democrats have repeatedly, as I pointed out earlier, used the legislative filibuster to their advantage during this Congress. In March, Democrats filibustered our largest coronavirus relief bill, the CARES Act, until Republicans agreed to add some Democrat priorities. And Democrats quickly took credit for making the bill better. You would think Democrats would want to preserve this influence, especially, especially now the Democrats have experienced the consequences of their decision to abolish the judicial filibuster. Of course, when they say they want to abolish the legislative filibuster, Democrats mean that they want to abolish the legislative filibuster if they win a majority in November. They have a lot of legislation they want to pass, and they don't want to have to moderate that legislation to address Republicans or Americans' concerns. But I would remind my colleagues that no one is in power forever. And if Democrats do win in November and abolish the legislative filibuster, they may quickly come to regret that decision once they're in the minority again. Because no matter how permanent a majority thinks it will be, sooner or later, every majority party returns to minority status. Mr. President, in addition to doing away with the bipartisan nature of the Senate, ending the legislative filibuster would also erode the stability of government. Legislation would become more partisan because the majority would now have, not have to take into account the opinions of the minority party. And that would make legislation likely to be reversed as soon as the opposite party gained the majority in a future Congress. Without the legislative filibuster, 
it's not hard to see a future in which national policy on a host of issues could fluctuate wildly every few years. Taxes could go up and down on a regular basis. Government programs could be stopped and started every few years. The consequences for individuals, businesses, and our economy would not just be unpleasant, but potentially devastating. Mr. President, I understand the frustration of my Democrat colleagues. I've been in the minority in the Senate. My first eight years here, I was in the minority. I also know what it's like when you get into the majority and can't pass everything you want because the minority party will filibuster your bills. I've certainly had moments when I wished we could just pass legislation with a simple majority, especially coming from the House of Representatives. Democrats have stood in the way of a lot of legislation I'd like to have passed this year, from Senator Scott's police reform bill that I mentioned earlier to additional coronavirus relief, to pro-life legislation. It's also important to note that not every filibuster has been undertaken for noble purposes. Like every tool, it can be misused. But I know that no matter how frustrating the filibuster may be in the moment, preserving it is essential to preserving this institution of the Senate and the purpose for which it was created. It's essential to protecting minority rights. And it's an essential check on tyrannical majorities that would seek to curtail our freedoms. Mr. President, legend has it that when Benjamin Franklin was leaving the Constitutional Convention, someone approached him and asked him what form of government the convention had instituted. A republic, Franklin said, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. Mr. President, today the legislative filibuster is the key rule preserving the Senate's constitutional role as a check on partisan passion. And I pray that no future Senate will destroy the Senate's essential role in our system of government for temporary partisan gain. Mr. President, I yield the floor.